Now we come to continental extension and rifting. In this lecture, I'll cover the progression from rifting to passive margin and ocean spreading, active versus passive rifting, uniform versus depth dependent rifting, pure shear and simple shear mechanisms, narrow versus broad rifts, the development of core complexes, and the role of magnetism in rifting. So why are rifts important? They are the manifestation of lithospheric scale extension and ultimately the breakup of continents. So this is a fundamental part of the Wilson cycle. Rifts preserve the rock record in their basins and produce long-lived flaws in the crust that are often reactivated. Modern rifts are often a major source of geothermal energy and also modest volcanic and earthquake hazards. Rift basins contain water and petroleum resources, and post-rift subsidence can also form basins that contain significant resources, like the North Sea and Anadarko Basin. So if we're looking at the progression from rift to drift, we see that in the rifting stage, we have non-marine flood basalts and intrusions, terrestrial sediments filling the basins that are formed, and then we move to the rift to drift transition where we begin seafloor spreading. Um, a shallow, narrow sea develops and evaporate deposits um, are formed. And then we move to the drift stage where there's a formation of passive margin basins where marine carbonates and terrestrial sediments are covering the rift drift sediments. And that's after 20 to 100 million years. Rifting is not spreading. Rifting involves the stretching of pre-existing crust and mantle lithosphere. Spreading creates new oceanic crust. Rifting doesn't. Continental crust rifts. Oceanic crust spreads. Continental rifting ultimately may lead to seafloor spreading, and this also produces a passive margin. And allocogens are failed rifts that form at high angles to the passive margins. The, those passive margins being the successful rifts. So let's look at the Wilson cycle. This is, this diagram on the left shows a progression from A to H of what the Wilson cycle is. And in A, we see a doming and Vol basaltic volcanism taking place across a dome. The formation of three rifts uh, at a triple junction. Then one rift failing and two successful rifts. So this is the allocogen here that might become, uh, that might develop into a river valley that leads to a delta and a continental margin, and then two successful rifts that um, then continue to develop. Or we could move from the rift, rift, rift stage to form three spreading centers meeting at that triple junction but ultimately that's going to lead to subduction because we can't infinitely expand earth we have to maintain its volume so that won't last long in the more usual case we have this scenario where two rifts are successful and one rift uh, forms uh, fails and forms the allocogen and in in that case we are opening an ocean and again ultimately leading to subduction and then uh, collision in the end. So perhaps at this stage of that, diagram, that diagram showing the Wilson cycle we should look at this cartoon that shows the opening phase in the Wilson cycle where we have stable craton, 
and then rifting that leads to ocean floor spreading and the development of passive margins like we've been talking about. And then it moves to the closing phase where after that uh, ocean has developed, um, a subduction zone must form. That ocean then closes and then you uh, have a continental collision zone. And then this, this final model just shows um, erosion and breakdown of that mountain belt. That is the Wilson cycle. And what happens with the allocogen on the right is that it's the, the rift has formed, and so we have thinned crust uh, subsidence that leads to uh, sediments filling basins that are formed, and ultimately um, a foundering of that medial block within the failed rift. So uh, that could include delamination into the mantle. This figure illustrates the abundance of failed rift systems associated with continental breakup. And this shows a Triassic Earth with the continents um, pushed back together. But notice the allocogens formed between Greenland and North America, between Greenland and Europe, between South and North America, around Australia and Antarctica. India, Eastern Africa, and here in North America. The lochagens are stranded by the ocean spreading, and here you can see um, the lochagens across the western U.S., including the lochagen along the Mississippi River that generates some large earthquakes sometimes because it's a weak part of the crust there and gets reactivated from far field stresses within the continent and generates earthquakes. And the East African rift, of course, is the failed arm of the two successful rifts in the Gulf of Aden and the Red Sea. And this is either going to become an allocogen and fail entirely, or perhaps it could evolve into a spreading center. But ultimately, any oceans that open up again would be subducted. So what causes rifts? If we think about an active model for um, rifting, then it would involve mantle plumes and magmatism pushing up underneath the base of the lithosphere and uh, causing divergence or rifting in the upper crust and then ultimately thinning of that crust. We think of a more passive model, it could involve uh, the collapse of mountain belts so where you know even in the himalaya where we see normal faults have to develop during uh, continental collision the normal fault faults are helping to maintain isostasy and in the end those normal faults can continue to move and combined with erosion it can break down a, a, a mountain but that extensional collapse of an origin can lead to uh, rifting. We might have uh, here just an old collisional belt that is sprinkled with faults that were no longer active but are forming those weak places in the crust. Those could be taken advantage of. And certainly in both of those cases, the old sutures are weak points in the crust. And in the case of some subduction zones, 
where we see a slab rollback, that is where the angle of the slab increases and rolls back to uh, a different position, perhaps from density increases in the subducting oceanic crust, becomes denser and pulls down more steeply into the mantle. That kind of rollback can lead to spreading in a back arc basin, again creating thinning the crust and creating a place where um, mantle up upwelling can take place. And finally, if we're looking at um, a transform fault boundary, there might be uh, a left step in a left lateral strike slip fault zone or a right step in a right lateral strike slip fault zone that leads to these pull apart basins that again could be um, a, a large enough structure to help to thin the crust and cause the rifting to start. So if we look more closely at some active rifting models, this could be caused by mantle upwelling and basal traction on the lithosphere. This can create doming and volcanism, um, perhaps flood basalts, and erosion on, of that dome can precede rifting. The plume could thermally weaken the lithosphere. It's likely going to weaken the lithosphere making it more susceptible to extension. In passive rifting models, those can be caused by plate stretching that is in response to far field stresses, so stresses on the scale of the continent or the plate, um, and also basal traction on the lithosphere. Uh, subsidence, um, but perhaps with no volcanism or erosion prior to, prior to rifting. And stretching increases the geotherm, so potentially producing magmatism after the onset of rifting. So again, this is a decompression melting of the mantle lithosphere that's going to take place under thinned crust. Now, this could be um, a false dichotomy because there are instances where we see some of both what might be passive or active rifting mechanisms taking place. And we can use Ethiopia as an example where there is a, a plume uh, underneath the Afar area that uh, it, it has had significant magmatism about the same time as the rifting was taking place. And uh, both of those mechanisms can stretch and weaken the lithosphere. All of that was happening around 30 million years when that afar plume, plume head arrived. And that was just active upwelling without any rifting. But then 20 million years ago or so, that regional rifting um, took place and thermally reacted, reactivated the craton in response to those far field stresses that were causing the rifting. And just keep in mind that the heating of the lithosphere weakens it, and you can recall that from these Christmas tree diagrams, where moving down in the crust, you get to a point where heating um, is significant enough that it weakens quartz, in the crust, or if you're in, looking at the mantle, it weakens the olivine. And that is from heating. And with higher heat flow, in some areas that have already thinned lithosphere, a higher heat flow means that it doesn't take as much tectonic force in those far field stresses in order to deform the lithosphere. We can look at some of the active intracontinental rifts that are around, and those include the um, basin and range, salt and trough, Rio Grande areas in North America, 
the Rhine Graben and the Aegean Sea in Europe. Uh, we have the East Africa Afar area. In Asia, we have the Lena Delta, uh, Lake Baikal, and the rifting in Tibet. And then the Woodlark Basin and Taupo areas um, in Oceania. Now, Ethiopia and Afar are a classic uh, triple junction of three rifts. Baikal and the Western Rift of the East African Rift are major continental rifts with not very much mag magmatism and they're controlled by old sutures. The Rio Grande Rift is a major continental rift zone that occurs in an area with considerable pre-rift tectonism. It cuts across Precambrian trends and it's got a small amount of young basaltic vol volcanism. The Kenya Rift so further south in the East African Rift System is a classic continental rift valley with considerable magmatism and young volcanoes in the center of the rift axis. The Basin and Range is a wide, highly extended area with a fairly constant crustal thickness, even though extension locally is varying by a factor of at least two. And that suggests that there's a large magmatic input into the lower crust. We can look at the gravity evidence of some of these rifts. And this is North America. We see the Southern Oklahoma allocogen and the mid-continent rift that actually follows a more complex trend here like this. The gravity response shows uh, a gravity high um, in those rift systems and so those are showing up all the rifts are showing up as gravity highs in these darker red colors the southern oklahoma allocogen is there's a massive intrusion of the upper crust um, it formed a post drift basin and there was reactivation of faults reversing normal motion the mid-continent rift also again a lot of magmatism in the upper crust um, in which the pre-existing crust had largely been destroyed. If we look at some of the morphological expressions of rifts, so across either a single graben or across an entire province like the basin and range, you generally see a, a rift valley that is filled with sediments and uplifts on the flanks of the rift if we look at the Red Sea as an example, the topography there shows exactly this structure. Or if you look at a wider rift zone with the, the basin and range being the drop down basin, um, the Sierra Nevada and the Wasatch Mountains form those flank uplifts. And then looking at the, in Eastern Africa again, on the right, you see the same structure with a drop down rift valley and flank uplifts. And I just want you to, to notice in, in this example that there's a change in the polarity of the half graben comprising the rift. So with normal faults on the east, on the west, and then on the east again. That will come up later. Continental rifts vary in dimension and there are listed here um, many different rifts. Not, it's not comprehensive list by any means, but you'll see the, it's, this shows the rift valley width, the sediment thickness, the relief on the flanks, how wide the flanks are. And while it looks like there's a lot of variation, overall, we might be able to generalize and say that rift valleys have a width around 40 kilometers and that the, the relief on the flanks is about one and a half kilometers.
the sediments that fill the rift basins are about three kilometers thick and the width of the flanks on those rifts are about uh, 100 kilometers. If we consider an Andersonian faulting in these models, that creates a block that is isostatically subsiding into the mantle in one model, or a weak lower crust. So on the left, we see the, a crustal block dropping down into the mantle with isostatic forces controlling that. Or on the right, we see um, a weakened lower crust with fault blocks dropping down into that weakened lower crust. Now, an unloading of the foot wall causes an elastic flexural uplift. So here, if you place a load on the hanging wall side of a fault, it drops a block down and then there's a flexural response um, following that. And also at the base of the lithosphere, there can be some thermal erosion or rheological changes that increase the thickness of the lithosphere. Now, we can use either a pure shear or a simple shear model for actually extending the crust. Here I show a uniform or a pure shear stretching of the whole lithosphere. And you can think about pure shear deformation as being like pancaking. So you take uh, a sphere, you apply a compressional stress to it, and you end up with a flattened, uh, a flattened sphere, a pancake where extension has taken place in the other directions perpendicular to that uh, compressional stress. And in that model, you s evenly stretch the lithosphere and you might end up with a, a cross section of the earth that looks like this um, between Norway and the Shetland Islands, where we have an, an even drop down basin along ductly deformed lower crust. And if we're going to talk about these extension models, we should really define better the magnitude of that stretching. And so we can use the stretching factor beta, which looks at um, the ratio of uh, a stretched width or height of a package of rocks compared to the original package of rocks. And if we think about pancaking at, in a pure shear model, we can imagine a compressional stress sigma one that is compressing vertically this block of crust. And what happens is you get stretching in this direction, left and right, and in and out of the screen. So beta in this instance is a prime over a or b over b prime. And for most, uh, for most rifts, the stretching factor is um, 1.2 to 2.0. So keep that in mind. And why do rifts subside? Well, subsidence is caused by rapid stretching. This is the initial tectonic subsidence, and that's followed by slow cooling or a thermal subsidence. So the tectonic subsidence is the stretching, thinning the crust, and it increases the bulk density of the lithosphere, causing it to subside isostatically. So this is a fault-controlled subsidence. The thermal subsidence is uh, when rifts continue to subside slowly as a result of cooling because the crust is becoming more dense 
the cooling results in an, uh, initially uplifted isotherms. So that's the lithosphere, asthenosphere boundary, for example. Um, and the total subsidence is that both the tectonic and the thermal subsidence combine. And those two effects give rift basins the characteristic steers head architecture. And I just have an example of steers head model down here on the right. So we can plot that uh, subsidence versus the time since rifting. And this graph also shows the stretching factor beta. And it it shows the initial tectonic subsidence from faulting, and then the thermal subsidence um, from the changes in the isotherms. So this graph shows uh, the subsidence due to instantaneous uniform extension for a range of stretching factors from 1.25 to infinity. And there's clearly a linear relationship between crustal stretching and the total subsidence. And for typical values of beta, we have uh, a total subsidence uh, less than about three kilometers. And that probably corresponds to um, that the sediment thickness in those rift basins of about three kilometers. So there is a thermal perturbation due to this instantaneous uniform extension. And if we consider uh, the crust and lithosphere before rifting, it has a geotherm that looks like this. Uh, at the time of rifting, the crust and lithosphere are thinned and the lithospheric geothermal gradient increases. After rifting, there is uh, a relaxation and the geotherm returns to normal conditions after some time. Importantly, the heat flux increases with the magnitude of stretching. So here the stretching values beta and they increase upward. And this shows that the heat flux or the heat flow is also increasing with that stretching. So extension is not instantaneous. It is spanning a longer period of time, perhaps five to 50 million years. And this plot shows the duration of the rifting stage for abortive rifts. So paleo rifts or the failed arms in those rift systems. And what this is showing is um, also the, the duration of rifting in the, the R value, so in that case 210 million years, the periods of doming that take place in some of these rifts, and any volcanic activity in the stars. And what we're seeing is a, a wide variation in not only the, uh, how long the rifting event spans, but also when during that rifting volcanism is important or takes place, or whether any doming is taking place as well. In successful rifts, um, we see a similar kind of variation, and there really is no um, dependence on the duration of stretching as to whether a rift is going to be successful or fail. It really depends on the stretching rate. Because even in these successful rifts, we see the same kind of variation in rifting event length, as well as the timing of the volcanism. So those things don't control whether a rift is going to be successful. It's the stretching rate that's important. But the spreading rate controls the thermal behavior. Here, 
these diagrams are starting to stretch the lithosphere, starting on the left hand side and progressing to the right. In these models, you'll have to look closely at the axes, but the width of the model domain increases. So the width is increasing and the thickness is decreasing. So we're pre preserving the volume. And in these upper two sets of models, we have a fast spreading rate of 16 millimeters a year. And in the lower models, we have a slow spreading rate of six millimeters a year. And in this case, the fast model does lead to breakup of the continent, whereas the slow model does not. These two rows are showing the temperature profile of the lithosphere um, with depth over time. So from 2 million to 10 to 20 million years in the upper model, and from 30 to 50 to 70 million years in the lower. And what you're seeing is that there's this thermal perturbation beneath the rift in the fast spreading rate model. So the lithosphere is becoming quite hot and there's upwelling in of those isotherms in the, the fast model. In the slow model, you see a small perturbation, but that disappears over time. In the fast model, we see crustal thinning focused right underneath the, the, the rift, whereas thinning the mantle is a much smaller magnitude. In the slow model, we see that the thinning is also focused underneath the rift, but that's not represented the same way in the mantle. And also notice that lithospheric strength is really reduced beneath the rift in the fast model, but there's no clear locus of weakening in beneath the rift in the slow model. Let's look more closely at the rift morphology and the stretching distribution. Now, in th this diagram, we have uh, a model steers head basin geometry where we see the initial subsidence at the bottom of the basin from the faulting followed by the a thermal subsidence that follows. There's an example in the North Sea in the Viking Graben where we see uh, post rift or thermal subsidence um, that began in the early Cretaceous and still continues overlying um, the, the initial uh, stretching and subsidence that took place over those normal folds. The steers head model assumes that the tectonic subsidence of a basin increases exponentially with time and that they load a lithosphere that increases its flexural rigidity with time. And in, in these models we're also seeing uh, onlap of sediments on the edge of the original basin. So this steers head model can be explained by a fractionally broader zone of rifting in the mantle than in the crust. And the top diagram shows a broader deformation zone in the mantle than the crust, this solid curve. And immediately after the instantaneous stretching, minor uplift is occurring adjacent to the basin on the flanks of that basin. And this can be seen in the East African Rift in the Gulf of Suez. And this is showing the total subsidence uh, 150 million years after rifting. And we see onlap produced by the thermal subsidence at the basin margins. Um, that again results in this steer's head geometry. If we look at uniform versus depth dependent extension, you'll see in a uniform extension model, the crust and the mantle are stretched equally. Um, in a non-uniform extension model, there is um, 
discontinuous depth dependent stretching and the crust and mantle are differentially stre uh, stretched. And then we have other models that give us greater stretching of the crust relative to the mantle that leads to more subsidence. And also notice that in these hypothetical models, we see subsidence in the uniform extension model, that there's subsidence in the rift basin, but uplift along the flanks in a model that is non-uniform. And that's similar to this, um, this last model on the bottom, but with increased subsidence in the rift basin. So with non-uniform extension, we see in this diagram um, crustal stretching on the x-axis and mantle lithosphere stretching on the y-axis. Uniform stretch stretching would then be represented by this line with a slope of 1. And we just looked at this non-uniform model where the zone of stretching is broader in the mantle than in the crust where we see places along the rift on those flanks where the mantle stretching is greater than the crustal stretching, we have uh, an uplift, and that's shown here. Whereas if we're looking in the rift center where crustal extension is greater than the mantle extension, that would give us an, uh, an area of subsidence, so the rift basin. Now most rifts have high angle faults at the surface and what happens to those high angle faults at depth and why might extension not be uniform uh, at depth? In a cross section through uh, basins we see uh, master faults that underlie the basins with antithetic faults dropping down the opposing side of the basin. And at depth, these normal faults are eventually going to encounter uh, the brittle ductile transition. And when that happens, there are many models that describe those normal faults becoming lystric and grading into a low angle normal fault at depth. We would call that a detachment or a decollement. Those upper crustal faults in the first place may be planar or they could be lystric. Here we have several planar normal faults that join a low angle detachment at depth. Or we could start with lystric normal faults to begin with, and those all then sole together in the decollement surface or detachment surface. The spreading would then proceed by uh, tilting or rotation of those planar or lystric normal faults over time. And structurally, those would leave a gap that's it's not possible, and so we have to have accommodation structures like rollover anticlines that would be accompanied by rollover synclines, or the formation of extensional duplexes at depth to accommodate the opening up of space in this extensional system. Ultimately, what we see in a pure shear environment might be this Horst and Graben uh, structure with extension being uniform and Graben's dropping down in between the normal faults, the horse or the ranges being brought up along the foot wall of those normal faults. Or we might see a simple shear model where the master normal fault becomes the lystric uh, 
soul to the other synthetic upper crustal normal faults, whether they're planar or lystric. In a pure shear environment, the shortening would be taking place uh, in the plane with the greatest compressional stress, and the lengthening would be taking place in the least compressional stress direction, leading to a symmetrical strain. In a simple shear environment, the lengthening is parallel to your least compressional stress, sigma 3, and that's at a high angle to your greatest compressional stress, sigma 1. And this leads to asymmetrical structures. Whatever the upper crustal structure at depth, extension in the lower crust really must be accommodated by subhorizontal ductal shearing. So if you look at end member models of either pure shear, simple shear, or a model that combines both pure shear and simple shear into them, what you see are in, in all of them these horizontal, sub-horizontal zones of ductal deformation that's taking place in the mid to lower crust or even uh, upper mantle. And these are happening in places in the crust where the thermal regime is such that you're moving from a brittle to a ductal regime. And the low angle normal faults that we see in these continental rift zones follow that brittle ductal transition. There are many metamorphic core complexes that sprinkle the basin and range. These black blobs are these core complexes that result from high degrees of extension along these low angle normal faults in places across the basin and range. They consist of a core of high grade ductally deformed rocks coming up in the foot wall of a detachment. This low angle normal fault is here. And above that are oftentimes unmetamorphosed cover rocks. And they're separated by the detachment of the decomal that has a myelinitic fabric to it. So very high strain zones. Again, that also uh, oftentimes is pointed at as the brittle ductal transition in the crust, now exposed. The core complexes form as a, as a result of simple shear extension of very warm crust, so this is already extended crust in this continental rift zone, at areas with large amounts of extension and no subsidence locally. A core complex might develop like this if you start with a, a rigid plate add a source of heat in the basin and range that heat is coming from lithospheric thinning. There is then a zone of myelinitization and extension and flattening near the brittle ductal transition and in the lower crust. The, cru the upper crust is then brittly faulted against these normal faults. Those normal faults then sole into a low angle decolement. And with continued exhumation and an isostatic uplift, the high grade rocks that are in the foot wall of this decolement eventually are exhumed uh, in the core of these metamorphic core complexes.
Now this idea of a rolling hinge model is that you start with a high angle normal fault that is progressively rotated and the dip decreases. Additional high angle normal faults then cut down through that crust as rotation continues. And what you're left with is a stack of these normal fault blocks that, again, soul into a low angle normal fault or decoma that then exhumes the high grade rocks from the mid to lower crust in the areas with the greatest extension. Now, a low angle detachment model might be applied to great depths as a, a whole lithosphere normal simple shear zone. A cross section through these models would look very different. We would see the, asymm the symmetric structures of a pure shear uh, detachment with the, the detachment forming at the base of those normal faults in the brittle upper crust and forming at the brittle ductal transition. Or it would be an asymmetric structure with that decollement potentially soling into the lithospheric mantle. A pure shear rift should look symmetric with topography being equal on both sides of a rift basin with uniform um, and symmetric crustal subsidence and thermal uplift. In an asymmetric simple shear model, the topography should look asymmetric with one side of a, a rift with more pronounced topography than the other side. It might have asymmetric crustal subsidence and uplift. And keeping those things in mind, if we look at the basin and range and the Red Sea Rift, to distinguish pure shear from simple shear models, Broadly, on the scale of the entire basin and range, we see a symmetrical profile to the basin and range province. We see a symmetrical profile to the Red Sea. We see some symmetry across the Afar Triangle and again across the Red Sea Rift. It is not perfectly uniform, but broadly, again, uniform with these flank uplifts surrounding the asymmetrical um, down-dropped Red Sea Rift Basin. There are grobbins that might be interpreted as asymmetrical, like the Viking grobbin in the North Sea. Some of the seismic reflection profiles might be interpreted to look like what uh, could be considered symmetric. Others can look asymmetric. The substance patterns might be somewhat asymmetric or more symmetric. It is hard to know if there is one end member that is characteristic of these rift basins. And perhaps the answer is that it's somewhere in between. Now, over time, these somewhat asymmetric basins could become more symmetric as the rift evolves. Half grobbins that are forming that have different asymmetries, so a grobbin forming with the normal fault on the west side versus a grobbin forming with the normal fault on the east side, those could link up to form a larger rift system, uh, linking those distinct rift segments instead of having a single rift propagate over time and unzipping along a rift axis.
Here's an ideal Rift Graben with the normal fault that soles beneath antithetic faults or synthetic faults. Those could eventually link in a zone of accommodation where transform faults could connect the different discrete segments of the rift and that differential shear can be taken up by that strike slip faulting. The East African rift has been used as an example of a prototypical narrow rift. But there, it is confused by the presence of the mantle plume. In the Afar region, magma is dominating the system and dominating what is driving the rifting. In the southern part of the East African Rift, faulting is dominant and magma is not nearly as voluminous as further north. And then the imaging that they have for the main Ethiopian Rift in the center, it looks to be a hybrid between a magma dominant and a faulting dominant rift system. However, it is probably incorrect to say that there is a temporal or a spatial uh, propagation from afar to the south or vice versa. East Africa is used as a prototypical narrow continental rift zone, whereas the Basin and Range province is used as the, a great example of one of these broad, wide zones of continental rifting. The differences have been explained by narrow rifts occurring in cold, strong crust and wide rifts occurring in hot, weak crust. And we could sketch those differences something like this with an, a zone of narrow deformation and magmatism in strong cold crust versus a broader area of deformation and melting in hot, weak crust with core complexes being some kind, forming in some kind of hybrid of the two. This diagram here plots heat flow versus crustal thickness. And what you'll see are the narrow rifts like the East African rift occur where heat flow is relatively low and crustal thicknesses are relatively th thin that the basin and range falls within this sweet spot of just warm enough crust and not too thick crust to form a wide rift. And core complexes forming in areas where heat flow is quite high or crustal thicknesses are quite large. So this, this first order variation in rift style uh, results from the thermal state of the lithosphere. Um, and I think Ethiopia and the Basin and Range are going to remain the poster children for narrow and wide rift end members. We look at localizing processes, so how we're getting strain weakening in order to nucleate uh, these rifts. We see that uh, a necking and thermal advection, uh, magmatic intrusions, or, or fault weakening, um, these models here, can result in a localization. The heat advection moves, moves the isotherms up and that mark the base of the lithosphere, and thin, that gives us thinning and weakening of the lith lithosphere.
Dike intrusion requires magmatic pressure to equal the horizontal stress and so reduces the tectonic stress needed for rifting. And the thermal capacity of the magma further weakens the crust. An extension on normal faults is easier than creating new faults, of course. There are other delocalizing processes or processes that give us strain hardening. And those could include a, a thermal diffusion to thicken and strengthen the brittle lithosphere, a viscous flow that strengthens material because the strength is proportional to the strength strain rate, uh, local isostatic forces that put the center of a low elevation basin into compression, or stress changes on and around a fault that inhibit uh, continued offset. In strong crust, the thermal advection substantially reduces the strength, uh, localizing rifting to um, uh, the scale of one lithospheric thickness. Whereas crust that's weak can initiate rifting outside that necked area that's put into comp compression by local isostasy, and it broadens the strain zone to a few lithospheric thicknesses. So the strength profiles of these two regimes look very different. Most lithosphere is stronger in extension than, in, than the available tectonic force, suggesting that extension only happens where crustal thickening, crustal heating, or diking weakens the crust. So whereas in a normal lithosphere, we have a strength profile that looks like this. If we increase the geotherm, it lowers the lithospheric strength and we see a reduction in the strength profile. Or magmatic intrusion allows extension of just modest tectonic forces, again with a different, very different uh, strength profile. Seismic reflection data shows magma in the crust beneath these rifts, and here's an example from the Rio Grande Rift. You can see the rift structure up at the top of the profile, and it's these bright spots along the profile that indicate there's melt. The interpretation of these is down below, and you can see that there are lots of small magma bodies and then the large Socorro magma body. It makes you wonder, are sills more common than dikes? Or is it just that these seismic methods only um, show horizontal structures? 3D tromography in the Ethiopian rift shows several discrete intrusions beneath the rift. And on the left, we have a, a depth slice at 10 kilometers showing the those red bodies, which are the melt bodies, beneath the central and northern main Ethiopian rift. And then the 3D visualization um, showing the same thing. There are probably solidified gabbros that underlie the rift, and intrusions seem to be per perpendicular to the extension direction. Um, modern extension is taken up by diking in the axial zone. This magmatic localization allows continental rifts to evolve toward uh, mid-ocean ridge spreading. In Ethiopia, uh, Miocene, Pliocene border faults control uh, the initial extension and the crust thermally weakens in the rift center. The magmatic injection localizes strain into just a narrow proto-ridge axis. And the magmatic zone is 20 kilometers wide. Uh, it gives uh, an extension rate of about eight millimeters a year for the last two and a half million years. So this quaternary extension is taken up by crustal growth from these intrusions. So at 30 million years, the Afar plume head arrives. There's active upwelling without rifting and it's ignoring the old crustal structure. 
At 20 million years, the passive regional rifting of thermally reactivated craton responds to far field stresses. And so this, the weakened lithosphere stretches. At 10 million years, mechanical rifting happens discontinuously and sporadically over, um, over time along the old suture. And those rifts occur along old weaknesses. And presently, magmatic rifting dominates. The plume head volcanism is orders of magnitude more voluminous than rift magmatism. And just look at the thousands of cubic of kilometers of volcanics that have come out the, from these flood basalts compared to the amount of the rift-related volcanics in yellow. The magma production depends on the stretching factor and on the mantle potential temperature. Um, this upper diagram shows uh, melt thickness um, generated by this adiabatic decompression melting of a cenospheric mantle over a range of temperatures. And importantly, crustal growth by intrusion leads to an overestimation of the original crustal thickness and underestimation of the stretching factor. An important thing to note is that the presence of melt has an effect on subsidence. And here we have the stretching factor plotted against the subsidence in kilometers. And over here, we have a range of model scenic temperatures. And what you see is that higher temperatures lead to far less subsidence than cooler asthenosphere. Rifting above hot mantle plumes can release enormous volumes of these decompression melts. Um, but then the question arises, which came first, the plume or the rift? And here are two examples with um, the plume going past uh, East Greenland and Iceland, and the plume that's present um, beneath afar on the Ethiopian rift. The petrologic view of this chicken and egg problem of rifting and magmatism may be that the rift chicken lays the magmatic egg. We stretch the lithosphere and thin it, and then pull up the asthenosphere and melt it with decompression melting. Whereas the mechanical view might be the magmatic egg grows into the rift, the plume intrudes the lithosphere and heats it, and that stretches and weakens the lithosphere. And those two models are really the difference between the mantle plume model and attentional failure model of uh, rifting.